Welcome to 7 Investing Now, a show that teaches you how to take a long-term view on investing by better understanding what's happening in the market now. Good afternoon, 7 Investors, and welcome to the Monday edition of 7 Investing Now. My name, of course, is Daniel Brooks Klein. I'm the host of the program, and I'm being joined on this President's Day by Max Chatsko and Steve Symington. Max, you're snowed in. Pittsburgh is what? What do you got, like 10 feet of snow? I've seen it on the news. It's a disaster. No, it's not that bad yet, but uh, it's going to keep snowing throughout the day, so I might be buried in here before too long. Well, we are sending our thoughts and prayers to our colleagues in Texas. Uh, Sam <laughs> Bailey is producing this program. It could go out at any time. Uh, there are rolling power outages in Houston because of the, uh, the incredible snowfall they have. Steve, they've got like a half inch, maybe three quarters of an inch. So yeah. basically, basically, that's like pretty much any 20 minutes for you in Montana. But it's President's Day. We're going to take your questions, but we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Uh, because the market's not open, uh, we're going to talk about how to build a long-term investing mindset. This is sort of the core of what we do at 7investing. And part of this is because I saw a story this morning in the Wall Street Journal. Steve, Max, jump in if you saw this. And the headline was, security guard took $20,000 personal loan to buy GameStop shares. He took a loan at 11% and bought $20,000 worth of GameStop shares near the high. And of course, he is now down 80%. And he seemed remarkably good natured about this. He actually said, I knew when I was doing it that it was a mistake. But here's the reality. We hear all this talk, oh, the market's not fair to little guys. Yes, it is. Everybody can be a long-term investor. And if you buy good companies and hold them forever, you're going to make money. I know that sounds simplistic, and we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of it. But now there's no commission trades. Basically, anybody can trade for free on any platform. You can buy fractional shares most places. So if you want to own a little bit of Amazon, you can own a little bit of Amazon. But Steve, why don't you explain it? What is long-term investing, and why does it matter to us so much here at 7 Investing? Right. So um, long term investing is is buy and hold. Uh, and, and a lot of people say, oh, this is boring. Um, you know, it's also a good way not to like lose all your money. Um, you know, and we're not talking about buying and holding for just a, a few days or less than a day or even weeks or even months. We're talking about buying and holding stocks for periods of years. Now, there's a reason when you look at the tax treatment for gains. Uh, that they have short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains. Now, uh, short-term capital gains taxes are applied for any stock you've bought and sold at a profit and that you held for less than a year. Anything more than a year, you pay less taxes on that. Uh, but we prefer to buy stocks and hold them for periods of at least three years here at 7 Investing. Uh, you know, I posted the other day on Twitter uh, a group of stocks that I'd held in my own personal portfolio for more than a decade. Some of them I've held as long back as 2007. Not everybody needs to have, you know, sort of that steadfast multi-decade approach, but that is the easiest, most predictable way to, uh, if you buy great businesses, you hold them for periods of years to uh, really supercharge your gains and let the power of compounding returns kind of do its work. And, uh, and you know, it's if you buy great companies, uh, you sleep better and uh, you make money. And it sounds like it's not fun, but you know what's really fun? To look at your portfolio year over year and see it get bigger. And I, I understand the rush of trading. I, I am a gambler. I like to play blackjack. I don't really consider that gambling. It's math. Uh, but I also like to sit down on a slot machine or a video poker machine. Slot machine, very risky. You're not going to win. Video poker, there are some systems to it. You can sort of do okay. Uh, but that being said, I get the idea. If you found a stock for a nickel and what if it goes to $2? Here's the reality. 97% of traders lose money. And those other 3%, most of them don't make any appreciable money. It is not going to be how you get rich quick. And all of these people screaming about what's a stock going to do after it reports? What's it going to do? Nobody knows. And we've talked about this a lot. Companies put out great earnings reports. Apple, a few weeks ago, put out a great earnings report. And the stock went down. In the short term, will Apple stock rise because the earnings were good? Absolutely. Amazon perpetually will put out a great earnings report, but talk about how it's going to invest in infrastructure. Something we've seen it do repeatedly and have, pay, have it pay off. But short-term investors are like, oh, I'm done with Amazon, and it'll go down in the short term. These are silly mindsets. But the core of long-term investing, and we would love your questions and comments in the queue, the core of long-term investing is identifying good companies that 
you're going to hold on to for three years, five years, seven years. I know I've only sold one stock in the last six years. So it's not uh, selling is not really part of my strategy, but we'll talk about that later. Steve, I'll let you go first. What's your process? And then we'll go to Max. Oh, man. Um, I guess first we should talk about, uh, you know, the fact that your investing process for finding uh, and identifying and buying good companies that make good long term investments, it's all personal. And uh, even among our team of lead advisors here at Seven Investing, we have different approaches to finding these companies. But there are, um, you know, some things that kind of tie them together. You know, we're looking for good businesses, uh, generally run by uh, good people uh, who are trustworthy. And uh, for me, uh, I'm looking for businesses that are relatively small uh, compared to their total addressable markets and have uh, what I consider a decent chance of actually capturing, capturing uh, or carving out uh, a decent um, amount of those addressable markets going forward. And uh, I'm looking for decent businesses that will grow over time. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into that. But uh, I kind of have this top down approach where I look at uh, big industries that are ripe for disruption often. And uh, I look at these small disruptors and determine kind of whether they have a reasonable chance of uh, succeeding over the long term. And uh, I like buying companies that can kind of grow into um, grow into uh, what is often you know steep valuations. Uh, I don't mind it when someone calls a stock overvalued, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this more, but valuation does matter. We appreciate your questions and comments. We're going to take them after we finish sort of our plan presentation here. So we, we very much want you to chime in. Max, you tend to invest in uh, and recommend here at 7investing uh, pre-revenue companies. So you're in the, the, the biotech space, the biopharma space. There's all sorts of ways to define it. Uh, but these tend to be companies that are working on really cool things. And I know I can put out an awesome brochure, uh, put my wife's name, who has a PhD, isn't in any way a medical doctor, but put her name on the masthead and say, we are working on a cure for cancer. And we are. We're Googling it. We're doing all sorts of things. And we'd <laughs> like to raise money. And it sounds good. But you have to ferret out the actual good companies that have real prospects. How do you do that when there's no revenue yet? Yeah. So, you know, I guess uh, when I'm, you know, investing in or recommending, you know, drug developers and their pre-revenue, their early stage drug developers, it looks very risky. And I guess it is risky relative to other things you can do. Um, but when I put out a company or I buy a company, you know, what you don't see is the 99 out of 100 companies that I looked into that I just passed on uh, that didn't look good. Um, you know, so three things that I look for where uh, I want to own this company. I think it has a good ch chance to be a good long term investment. I wanted to have a technology platform. Uh, so that means, you know, and it can have multiple drugs in the pipeline, maybe dozens or tens of drugs in the pipeline. So if one fails or two or three fail, it's not a big deal, right? It has other ways to insulate against risk. So that de-risks development of that company. Uh, I also look for companies that are addressing pain points. Uh, this can get a little into the nitty gritty, right? But uh, maybe there's some pain point in how you deliver, you know, uh, a genetic medicine or a gene therapy or a CRISPR therapeutic, right? And we hear about all the CRISPR stocks, but there's other companies working on pain points to make it more efficient and safer to use, you know, CRISPR therapeutic tools. Uh, so maybe some of those companies, they're, they're all private right now, right? So I'm not giving anything away. Uh, but, you know, some of those might be good investments, just as an example. Uh, and I also look for companies that have durable advantages. So, I look at the whole competitive landscape, right? There's companies addressing, you know, there might be dozens of drugs trying to take out or address uh, a certain disease or a certain cancer. Um, and some companies might have good results, but maybe compared to what else is going on in the competitive landscape, uh, maybe it doesn't stack up so favorably. So uh, I look for companies that have, um, you know, staying power. Um, so durable advantages, technology platforms, and addressing pain points. And that's kind of been a, a good mix of, uh, of uh, characteristics to find good long-term investments uh, in these pre-revenue early stage drug developers. So my process is more experiential. So I tend to look in, in, hey, I just did something, it was fun or I liked it or the service was great or it was a retail store and I really liked it. And then I look, is this, pub is this company public? So I already know the product is good, that I enjoyed the experience and then I start digging into the numbers and the management. And there's a lot of times, one, you'll just find it's not public or you'll find that the numbers are bad. I'll give you an example. Uh, BJ's restaurants are public and we eat there all the time, but the financial picture is kind of ugly. Like uh, I like them best of all of the like 
Chili's, Ruby Tuesday, that kind of space. But when you look at the numbers, you don't want to invest in it. So I'm a customer, not an investor. But I tend to start with things. And it might literally be like my mom tells me about an experience she has or how all of her friends shop at a certain place often. Like, you know, example is I don't own TJX companies, but it's probably a good investment for most people because it's recurring shopping. They have very low cost of goods. Uh, people are driven to those stores, their destinations. So that's how it works for me. And then we spend hours digging into the numbers and the financials and trying to find, is this company wasting money? Is it spending money well? Does it learn from mistakes? It's not an easy process. And that's what our subscribers get from us. They get our time. When he, we give you our seven picks, as Max said, you're not just getting the pick we made this month. You're also getting the 50 picks we didn't make. <laughs> and sometimes those might be picks that we make another month. I know for me this month, it came down really tight to two different companies. Uh, and the other one will probably be a pick in the future. But a lot of times you research things and you're like, ugh, like I, I hate the CEO or yeah, that experience I had was great, but it's not actually the norm. Like I'm sure somebody has gotten on American Airlines and had a good experience and they get off like, wow, American's great. And then they look and everyone else has not had a great experience most of the time and they don't want to invest. I'm being a little silly here. And Max, I will point out that my experimental drug is just a Skittle mashed into a marshmallow. I'm hoping nobody notices, <laughs> but it will bring people joy. And delicious. And that's, yeah, that's all you get <laughs> taking joyous in. It's, uh, all right, so let's, let's go to the next area. I'll go with Max first here. What are some pitfalls to avoid with long-term investing? Yeah, so sticking with what you were just talking about, um, you know, I think one thing I see a lot of people do, uh, long-term investing or not, is they kind of buy these story stocks, right? Uh, it's very common, especially now in this market, uh, and definitely in biotech. Um, you know, anybody can have a great website; it's real flashy, it's well done. Maybe they put out a nice-looking investor presentation, and uh, it all sounds good. And maybe you don't have a technical background to kind of tease out if you know, that company has a shot or not. Um, so you might buy the story stock, right? Um, and that oftentimes doesn't work out very well if you don't develop a thesis, right? Um, so we see this in biotech. I see it in renewable energy now, right? Um, look at like anything to do with fuel cells or hydrogen stocks or, uh, you know, electric vehicles, right? Everything's going to the moon. All these stocks are up really, like it's insane, right? What's going on right now? But a lot of times that's just the story. These companies haven't earned these, mm -hmm. you know, 10x valuation increases in a year. Uh, so you have to be careful and guard against that. And something that I see often, uh, maybe it's from more inexperienced investors, but, um, you know, if you don't develop a thesis, then you don't know by definition when that thesis would break. So you hold on to companies that aren't executing well, uh, that are getting, you know, toasted by the competition or just never going to be a good investment. And you just hold on because you're clinging to that initial story. Well, you know, this one company has the solar thingamabobber and solar is <laughs> gonna be so big one day, you wait. And uh, you know, you're gonna be holding that for a while and, and regretting it later. We, we see this a lot. So a lot of people will say to us, well, Tesla's big, what's the next Tesla? And if you look over the past four or five years, your best answer was Tesla. <laughs> that, <laughs> that you shouldn't go, well, here's another company doing it or, I believe the potential. Now, there might be companies in that space where you do your analysis and you develop a thesis. What's your thesis? I'll give you a very simple one. Starbucks. I own Starbucks. It's a company I really believe in. What do I believe in? I believe they're going to be able to grow in China massively. I believe they're going to improve their US operations with efficiency. We've seen some of this during the pandemic. That will double down uh, after the pandemic when they can operate as normal. I also believe they're going to be able to eventually leverage premium customers in the US and build out their grocery store business. I saw like five new Starbucks products in the grocery store through their partnership with Nestle, the first time I ever saw Nespresso pods. Those businesses are all gonna grow and they don't all have to grow, just some of them grow. The company's gonna do really well. So what do I watch? I watch each quarter in their earnings call did they advance those pieces? And if they didn't, what's the reason? Well, the reason is pandemic. Oh, okay, you didn't open a thousand stores in China last year because you had to stop for six months. That makes sense. So you track the story for the long term. If the story is, oh, Chipotle is big and this company says it's the Chipotle of Chinese, that's not a story. That's just a pitch meeting. Like that's, that's an idea. It's not a thesis. Steve, where can people go wrong? <sighs> Where can people go wrong? There's a lot of places uh, that they can go wrong. And and uh, I guess one important caveat is that, you know, all stocks have a story. 
And, uh, you know, the, buying a story stock isn't necessarily bad if there's actually substance underlying that story. Uh, and that's that's something that's really key. Uh, but the other thing people do is they buy great stocks and, uh, you know, they watch those stocks double or something and they sell them. <laughs> and uh, and I think that's that's maybe the biggest mistake people make. And if you ask people, what's your biggest investing regret? Most of them will come from selling too soon. And I think that's really, um, you know, that's one of the biggest places that long term investors go wrong is they sell great stocks after, you know, six months or whatever. And and uh, then they watch the stock go on to quadruple over the next couple of years and they regret it. And, uh, you know, it, it's killer because, um, you know, you're you're sacrificing gains by taking those profits. And and, um, you know, tr the other place that I, I see people go wrong is trading one good company for another. It's like they want to you know, rather than actually inserting more money into their brokerage account, even if it's a couple hundred dollars at a time. You know, just put a couple hundred dollars in here, there, uh, you know, they, they, they sell one stock to buy another and, uh, and then they regret it because the stock that they sold ends up outperforming. And uh, really the key to long-term investing is being patient, trusting your thesis. You buy the stock, you hold it and uh, do your homework over the course of the years that you own it and just determine whether this thesis remains intact. Um, you know, don't try and time your entries for tops and bottoms over the next couple of weeks. Uh, just add little bits to the stock over time. Uh, you know, there's nothing that says you can only buy it once. And, uh, you know, there's there are stocks that you know I've bought dozens of times over the course of several years. Um, and uh, you, you can, you know, just be patient. You don't have to swing at everything and you don't have to, to ditch everything that you own. Just buy stocks, hold them. And you should be steady. So what I do is with every paycheck, um, I put have a certain amount of money automatically transferred into my brokerage account. Mm -hmm. And I will generally spend that money right away on whatever it is I intended to buy. I might have to wait a day or two if it's uh, if I'm buying something that's one of our picks because we hear about the picks before you do, so we don't buy them until they're public. Um, so, or it might just be putting more money into something. And sometimes because I use TD Ameritrade, which doesn't allow fractional shares, I might want to buy something that's more expensive than what I put in each month. So then I'll decide, am I going to loan myself the money and maybe not make those weekly or bi-weekly deposits, or am I just going to put a little extra money in, but I'm steadily going forward with my portfolio and it's only buying, never selling. Uh, not never selling, but rarely selling. Steve, there are a couple of scenarios where we sell a stock. That's the next thing to talk about here. When do we sell a stock? Uh, yes. Um, and, and before that, I, I do want to note, uh, I see some comments coming in. We are paying attention to those. We're going to uh, dedicate some time to answering your questions. Uh, so please do post them in the comments section uh, below this video and uh, we'll, we'll get to what we can uh, toward the end. Um, but as far as when to sell a stock, um, the, the biggest place is to sell when your thesis breaks. Uh, you know, that's it. You, that's the importance. And it's, it seems silly. You know, there's a page on our site where we outline kind of seven investing principles that we follow, uh, when we're investing. And, uh, one of them is to, to form a thesis for what you buy. And it, it, it seems extraneous. Like, of course you form a thesis, but not everyone does. And that's kind of the problem Max was alluding to earlier when you're buying story stocks without really fully understanding what you're buying is that a lot of people don't have a thesis. And, um, you know, so form a comprehensive idea uh, of why you want to own the stock that you own and uh, determine whether those reasons are still intact or whether they've changed for the better or for the worse uh, over time. And if that thesis is broken, uh, that's a time when you can really consider selling a stock. Uh, the other thing is, and uh, I I hesitate a little bit on this one, is, is um, you know, people will sell stocks uh, if they get uncomfortable with how large the position is relative to their overall portfolio. Um, this is, again, more a personal decision. I personally don't mind uh, too much when I watch a fantastic stock uh, increase tenfold. And, uh, you know, I had one of Simon Erickson, our CEO's recommendations that I bought um, last year, and it's up 1100% in my portfolio. Absurd, not normal, fantastic call on his part. And that happens sometimes. Uh, I'm not selling that, even though it's a, it's a fairly significant part of my portfolio now. Uh, I don't mind letting that run and just continuing to add to other positions over time. But some people, 
uh, may want to trim back some of those and just sell a small piece of it. Uh, I don't usually like doing that, uh, but something I'd be remiss if we didn't at least offer the option. If it makes you nervous, like let's say something grows into half your portfolio and it was risky <laughs> yeah. in the first place and it remains risky and especially now. Mm -hmm. So right now, if a stock is up and this particular stock is up 1100% for good reason, but if you're right. up 1100% and it's because it's way ahead of what your thesis is, and you don't think it's ever going to justify that, that might be time to sell, might be time to trim back. Another place you sell is when your thesis is played out. So I, I made an example of Starbucks before. Let's say 10 years from now, Starbucks has 10,000 stores in China. They've opened uh, premium locations everywhere. They've saturated the grocery market. And when they have their earnings call, they talk about uh, how, well, we're going to save an incremental half percent by automating. And there's no more big growth plan. At that point, Starbucks might be a good business. It may no longer be a good stock. Now, I've never had that happen because good management usually finds ways uh, to advance the case. But there are industries where you might just get there and they decide, yep, this is what we are. Like, you know, not every company is Tesla where they're going to go, well, let's get into batteries. Let's get into solar. You might just be a mature automaker and you have your share of the business and that's what it's going to be. So when that happens, that is when you sell. Max, I know you also sell to pay your terrible, terrible gambling debts. No, that is a joke. Max does not have <laughs> terrible. Max, when would you sell a stock? You're I, the youngest of us, so you you have the longest time frame here. Uh, Dan, I told you that in confidence, so uh, <laughs> you, you've broken my trust. No, uh, I would second what Steve said, right? If your thesis breaks, that's a pretty important time to sell or strongly consider selling, obviously. Um, I would also add, uh, Steve also alluded to our, our seven principles on our website. And one of them is that it's personal, right? Um, you know, it's always one thing that's rubbed me the wrong way about how retirement gets discussed, right? It's almost like this industry. It's like a marketing pitch. It, it, retirement's pretty a new concept, really, right? Like there was no retirement 100 years ago. Um, so it just, it, I mean, because I'm young, I don't know, but <laughs> you, you save up all this money and you just quietly do this desk job that you hate and then you get old and great, but you have a bunch of money. Like, ah, what, what's the fun in that, right? So um, like I'm in a position where hopefully this decade, I'm looking to sell some of my portfolio and go buy a house or build a house. Uh, so if you're going to do that, some big life decision, life event, you know, maybe pay for a child's wedding, that's yeah. why you invest, right? To have money and assets and resources to be able to do those things. Um, and then I'd also add, similar to what uh, Dan was saying, uh, sometimes companies do kind of reach this maturity point and maybe they're great businesses, but they're not great investments anymore. So if that capital is not growing for you and your portfolio, it might be time to trim back or maybe sell out and put it into other companies that fit your you know, personal investing style. Um, so I've seen this a lot, actually, in drug development. You'll have companies that are small, early stage drug developers. They have a pipeline. They get drugs on the market. They're successful. And then they grow into you know companies that are valued at tens of billions of dollars. And then they just kind of fizzle out. They their stock goes sideways for many years, um, you know, and for whatever reason, right? There's new drugs are replacing old drugs that are losing market share, or maybe they're just not uh, adding new things to their pipeline. Maybe they're having clinical failures from the rest of their pipeline. Uh, but there's it, this does seem to be a trend in drug development. We can see maybe like a Biogen or Gilead Sciences or Insight Corporation. If you were an early investor in those, you've done very well. You're up thousands of percent. Um, but you know, lately they haven't really been doing so well. So maybe at that point you do maybe trim some positions or sell out and put that money elsewhere. I am never going to retire because when you do this for a living, why would you? But I do have <laughs> things I want to own. Like, you know, I, I might want to do this from a, a tropical resort uh, where I'm spending six months of the year or or whatever it is. We all have personal goals. I have a 17 year old in a couple of years. He'll go to college and, and, and we'll help with that, um, assuming he does his part. So it's very personal. And again, you could also sell maybe a company ethically has done something you don't like. The one stock I've sold in the past six years was WWE because ethically, and they, they did it again this week, they have not treated their workers well during the pandemic. They had layoffs despite being more profitable than they normally would be because they, they lose money touring and they're not touring. And now they've frozen all raises and promotions for people because their operating costs are a little bit higher because of the way they're taping television. The vast majority of their revenue is television. It isn't touring, it isn't anything else. 
I don't like when a company blanketly treats their workers badly to pop up their stock price. As a shareholder, I don't want that. I, I want to see a company say, yep, it's a pandemic. We're paying people more. We're treating people better. We're going to go to no layoffs. Even if everyone has to take a pay cut, that is me lecturing. Uh, Steve, have you ever sold too early? Absolutely. Um, and uh, I, I don't necessarily regret uh, a lot of the decisions I've made when I sold because uh, some of them have served as, as excellent excellent uh, opportunities to grow as an investor going forward. But uh, Max did mention earlier that uh, one of the reasons to sell might be uh, if you have something you want to buy. And I think um, uh, I, I've written about uh, for members of 7investing about how I sold basically across, you know, a basket of stocks in my portfolio, just kind of sold some evenly in order to make the down payment on the house that I'm sitting in right now. Uh, this was six years ago uh, that I sold those shares um, just kind of evenly across my portfolio. I figured out, oh, let's just shave down everything and I can sell that. I, if I did it, had to do it over again, I would have sold, um, you know, kind of my lower priority stocks rather than just selling a little bit of everything. Uh, one of the stocks I sold and I wrote about this too, way too early was Nvidia six years ago. Um, at about 21 and change per share, I sold almost 300 shares and uh, it trades at about $600 a share today uh, or it closed that there on Friday. So, uh, you know, those nearly 300 shares that uh, that I sold would have been worth closer to 200,000. And uh, funded well more than the down payment I put on this house that I hold another, you know, just six years. But um, I don't regret that case, you know, because I used it to to buy a house, which I don't consider an investment. I consider that a place for my family to live and to grow. Um, but I think that's, again, one of the biggest regrets that you'll see from almost every investor is selling something too soon. And I've had too many cases to count. Uh, look back, use it as an opportunity to improve going forward. I think that's the way to look at it. Max Chatsko, have you ever sold too soon? No, Dan, I'm perfect. I've always, uh, I perfectly timed all of my exits at exactly the peak. And because uh, you can time the market. Everyone that says you can is wrong. No, um, that's wrong. You, you cannot time the market. Don't do it. That's the point of long-term investing. Um, yeah, of course, I've sold things too early. And uh, I'm still closer to all of my early investing mistakes than maybe uh, than you guys. So, uh, um, but as Steve said, you know, good lessons to learn. You kind of have to learn some of those the hard way. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as you don't repeat those mistakes and you learn from them, then that is pretty valuable. We get asked all the time why we don't set targets. Uh, you know, at what dollar value do you sell a stock? It's because here's the reality. Good companies are good companies. And generally, right. they find ways to grow. So people look, look at Apple. They say, well, it's a two trillion. Could it really get to four trillion? Yeah, if Apple figures out healthcare, it can get to six trillion. So, you know, and, and will they? I don't know. There's absolute risk to that. Uh, but that being said, if you buy companies and hold them for a very long time, your winners are going to vastly outpace your losers. Steve, one of the things people ask us is they get nervous. You know, a stock they own, a stock we've recommended has a 10%, a 20%, God forbid, a 50% drop. That's happened. I own Microsoft. That's happened multiple times right. in the history of Microsoft. What do we tell people? Like, how do you sort of tune out that noise? Um, keep in mind that volatility is a, a feature, not a bug of the markets. And, and we're not talking about, you know, 1%, 2% drops. That happens every day. Uh, there are some stocks that, that we have recommended that will swing wildly 5, 10, 15% in a single day on no news, uh, especially in this sort of insane market that we currently sit in. Uh, and it's tempting to kind of trade those, but just... You know, when when you see those kinds of big swings, take a look at what's happening. Determine if there's anything material uh, that has changed relative to the, the the business as it was when you bought it. And uh, more often than not, you'll find there's really no difference. Um, and uh, just just keep a level head. And that's something that we preach here uh, often is trying to just stay calm through all the noise and uh, recognize that you know while you have stock prices that are doing this. More often than not, the, the state of the business is doing something like this. And, uh, you know, as long as you can determine that um, that the business itself remains strong, uh, that more often than not, that stock is just, you know, continue to hold weather those fluctuations and recognize that they're normal. And there's a couple comments to that end. Steve, um, Steve well. I use the same strategy I do for buying the like four different items of clothing I wear. So like, <laughs> you know, I own an awful lot of black dress shirts. 
Yeah. And if I go to the store at the mall that sells, or it's at the outlet mall that sells the black dress shirt I buy, mm -hmm. and I happen to notice it's on sale, which after the pandemic, everything was like 80% off, yeah. I bought a bunch of them. Do I need more? Absolutely not. But will I eventually need more? That's how I look at it with stocks. If there's a company I believe in and I own and it drops by 30%, I pick yeah. up some shares. Um, there's going to be volatility. I, my pick last month was a risky pick by my standards. And it's had days that it's been up 25%. And it's had days that it's down 25%. What I will tell people is what's going on now isn't all that normal. It's one of the caveats we make about our returns. We're really excited about how much the seven investing portfolio is beating the market. But we also understand that we're smart, but we're not this smart. There's a lot happening right now that would play out over much slower time periods if the market was normal. Max, your stocks are really, really volatile. Like I, I own a few of them in my portfolio and they'll be like a stock that was like way in the green yesterday. Like it's my overall investments up 40%. And then I, I turn in today and I'm like, wait, I'm losing money on that stock. Like I wish I remembered what the ticker stood for. How do you process volatility? Yeah, so definitely uh, no stranger volatility when you're investing in early stage drug developers. But it's just like Steve said, and I know it sounds simple. We keep saying this, but that's because long term investing is kind of simple. Um, it all goes back to your thesis. You know, if, if um, you know, a stock drops on the day and there's no news, then, you know, your thesis didn't change. Right um, now in drug development, of course, um, you know, there can be some bad days, right? Maybe a, a company issues a press release and they had some mixed results in a clinical trial. Um, and, you know, Wall Street uh, has invented the knee jerk reaction, right? So it's it's not uncommon for even maybe good results or so-so results to, you know, cause the stock to fall like 30% or so. Now, if my thesis doesn't change, I'm not gonna sell. And oftentimes, more often than not, I usually use those as buying opportunities. I pick up more shares uh, of companies that I like. And again, I look at companies with technology platforms. So maybe that asset is a total failure and they write it out and they kick it out of the pipeline. It's gone for good. Well, there's still, you know, 10 other drugs that they're working on. So um, it's not a bad day to buy more shares, right? Yeah. Um, and Steve, I want to highlight a comment, uh, a comment from Lewis Carruthers in the, uh, from YouTube over here in the comment section. He says the stock market in the long run is determined by company performance. Long-term investors take advantage of short-term trader sentiment and focus primarily on company performance. Uh, in many ways, that's what we do at seven investing. Uh, we provide our top seven stock ideas every month to our paying subscribers. And, uh, and that's one of the things that I personally love to do. And you'll find that, uh, when I make my recommendations is I find uh, disconnects between the current share price and where the actual state of the business is. And, uh, and I intend to buy these companies and hold them for years, as we've stated before. Uh, but that's um, part of the fun of being a long-term investor is you can recognize uh, if you build up a watch list of uh, businesses that are worth buying and when they are. And, uh, you know, and sometimes that means buying a stock at its all-time highs because you think it'll just continue climbing from there. Uh, but sometimes it'll just be a beaten down name that I think is unjustifiably uh, hurt. And uh, that's kind of fun to uh, to watch play out. So, I mean, in that sense, long-term investing isn't really boring. It's it's more a matter of knowing when to buy, um, you know, not trying to time tops and bottoms, just recognizing that disconnect. And one of the things you have to do is tune out the analysts and the media reporting on it. One of the mm -hmm. companies I recommended a few months back uh, had a blowout quarter, incredible numbers, and fundamentally grew its customer base. So everything was good about the business. And one analyst came out and said, yeah, but their comps will be tough next year. And you're right. On the top line, their comps will be tough because they had some pandemic-driven sales. But their margins, which were not great during on some of those pandemic-driven sales, which were largely food, which is a low-margin item, their margins on what they'd sell in a normal quarter would be higher. So who cares, Steve, if you make 80 grand on 2 million in business or 80 grand on a million and a half in business? That doesn't matter. In fact, you might be better off. There's lower inventory risk of making it on the smaller number. So the reality is a lot of the people covering the market, the CNBCs of the world, and I, I want to say I hate to pick on CNBC, but I don't. I love to pick on CNBC because I think a lot of times <laughs> what they're doing is they're playing into irresponsible trends. Uh, you know, we see it with Robinhood. Is Robinhood inherently bad? No, not exactly. But they they give you, you know, you know great graphics when you make a trade, when you sell like. And here's the reality. They should be giving you, good job, you've held a stock for six months. Great job, you've held it for a year. 
the entire industry we're in reinforces the wrong things. They reinforce what happened today. And that only matters if it's going to affect the long term. Like, so if, you know, when Steve Jobs dies, does that impact the thesis for Apple? It could. You have to see how Tim Cook can do that job. That, but if, if Tim Cook has a cold, that doesn't affect things. Maybe he has an off day, but he's, it doesn't change the thesis for the company. We have one more topic here. Then we're going to take your questions. We have some that we got on Twitter, some that we got live. Uh, I'm going to start when we get there, Sam, with Gaza, and then we are going to go down the list. I'm telling this to Sam Bailey, our director, so she knows which ones we're going to pull up. Obviously, we will skip the one we already answered. You're giving her time to uh, take her mittens off today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will go with Max first. Uh, is there anything people need to know about long-term investing that we haven't brought up, brought up here? Yeah, you know, when I write long-term investing or about it, I always use the term long-term mindset. And I think that's important to note is that it is a mindset, right? Um, and there's a lot of parallels to other things in life, right? If you take a step back about what is long-term investing, you know, well, having success in long-term investing, it's quiet, you know, it just builds slowly over time. Um, and that's how a lot of success works in life, right? It's not the guy who's on the megaphone talking about how great he is. Um, it's usually the person who just has their head down and is working and putting in the time and doing the work. Um, you know, and over time, those little successes build up and, and that's a lot of, you know, how long-term investing works, right? It's quiet. You're kind of taking the emotion out of it. Um, so, you know, it's really a mindset. Um, Steve wants to jump in there or <laughs> that, that was an abrupt stop, Max. I felt like you had someplace else to go and you just cut off there. But Steve, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, I had, I had a bunch of snow slide off my roof and I kind of like that threw me off. I don't know. Right. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I took a, uh, I took a big breath because that's, that's sort of like, a ah, you know, it, it's sort of, you'll never see our team freaking out uh, about, you know, one of our stocks, you know, crashing or something. We, we don't stress ourselves out, uh, over investing. And, um, I, I think that's very important. And it is exactly what you said, Max. It's, it's all about the mindset. It's about being patient more than anything else. And, uh, and just not stressing yourself out. That's another one of our, our core principles at seven investing It's just not stressing yourself out. Uh, when it comes to uh, the stock market, uh, it shouldn't be some scary, uh, riveting thing. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's really fun to watch the thesis of, uh, the companies that you recommend start to play out and watch their stock price react accordingly. But again, that's more about patience and having the right mindset for long-term investing. So we're going to take your questions and comments. We're going to kick it off with one from Gaza Shan, who, uh, he says, what you guys are doing is amazing. I'm going to use this to kick off our promo. So what do we do? What, why are we here at seven investing? Yes. We do this live free show that we, we, we spread broad long-term investing advice, but the core of what we do is our seven picks. Each month, every one of us, uh, we do research, we dig in and we figure out what our highest conviction stock pick is that month. We do a write-up on it, we record a video call, we make these cool PowerPoint presentations. I was working on mine all morning. Uh, we present to each other and we can ask questions. So if Max doesn't like what I have to say, he could say, Jisha, you're missing something about this company. I, of course, push back. I know deeply, I know the bio, no, I don't. So <laughs> Manisha tends to push back on Max more than any of the rest of us. But you get to see that process. We release those videos later on down the month. So as a member, you get access to us. You get access to all the time we put in. And long-term investing is for everybody. We started with this at the beginning. The little guy does have an advantage. It's time. We can make it fun. We can hold your hand. If you're an experienced investor, we can you know, help you feel better about your own convictions. If you're inexperienced, we do members-only calls where you can ask any question. We do new members calls where you can come on board and really ask us about the process. We want to make it so everybody, whether you're making 30 grand a year in the beginning of your career and putting in 50 bucks a month, or you're a multimillionaire and you're putting in tens of thousands, seven investing is for you. That multimillionaire guy, we should have charged more, but we charge everybody $17 <laughs> a month or $170 a year. How do you join? You go to seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. It is simple. It is safe. I promise you it is the best money you will ever spend. Stephen Hines asks, uh, it seems that dividend uh, increasing over time is 
is a different method than seven investing uses. I guess the difference is long-term income versus long-term growth. Can you comment? So here's how I look at dividends. It's gravy. So if I buy a good company, Microsoft's a good example. I've mentioned that I own Microsoft. It's my longest and it's my biggest holding. If you bought Microsoft and you go, okay, they're spending plenty of money on research and development. They pay their people well, so retention is good. Uh, they're buying back, they're doing all sorts of things and they wanna pay a dividend. I look at that as a bonus and it's great. And if I was retired, that dividend might be income for me. Now I just automatically reinvest it. So we're not against dividends. Um, I tend to believe in you buy good stocks and when it comes time to retirement, you sell off 4% of your portfolio a year or whatever that number is to fund what you're doing. You have to do that math yourself. But absolutely, we do pick stocks with dividends. So if you're a member and you want a dividend strategy, um, we have recommended plenty of stocks with dividends. Steve, you want to weigh in here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I just sent an email the other day to a subscriber who wrote into our uh, email inbox. That's info at seveninvesting.com. Uh, I'm usually the one answering that. And they were asking about dividends. And uh, I dug through our list of uh, recommendations. And we have about a dozen or so names that do pay a dividend. Some of them are pretty healthy. And some of them are considered primarily dividend stocks. So uh, while a lot of the stocks we focus on are like small cap growth stocks or, you know, SaaS stocks or uh, some pretty uh, high returning names, there are several uh, stocks in our list that uh, would be considered really um sort of stalwarts in the dividend paying space. Uh, we offer a little bit, uh, something for everybody uh, to that end. So dividends are great. Like you said, Dan, uh, they're gravy. Uh, I recommended a stock about the middle of last year, I think that uh, pays a little tiny dividend that I expect will increase substantially over the next several years. But uh, really what we focus on is just no matter what, providing our single best idea, each of our advisors provides their top idea in the stock market every single month. If that happens to be a dividend paying stock, then so be it. Um, but you know, often it's not, and uh, sometimes it is. So I wouldn't say we're really um, against uh, dividend stocks, but uh, I'd say more than anything, uh, it just, just happens. Yeah, to be and believe it or not, I actually chose a dividend stock in December 2020 <laughs> for my recommendation, right? So yeah. I'm young, right? I'm 30 years old, not bragging, but uh, so, you know, <laughs> I mostly invest in these small drug developers and I look at them as growth investments. But since I've joined Seven Investing, I've actually started to add positions uh, to various dividend stocks because, you know, I'm 30 now, but what happens when I'm 40 or 50? The money I put in now might be getting, you know, a 10% yield or, or more, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Uh, so I'm kind of laying that, planting those seeds uh, now so that, you know, by the time I'm old and gray or grayer, I should say, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll already have some income in my portfolio. <laughs> what I won't do is buy a bad company because it pays a good dividend. And I'll give an right. example. Some people like this company, but I don't like at and I they don't like their customers. I don't like them owning media companies. It's an incredibly capitally intense business. T-Mobile is a much better wireless provider, but they're a strong dividend payer. So a lot of people own them as part of, an, of a dividend strategy. I don't believe in that. I still want the underlying company to be one I want to invest in. And if, cause there are plenty, you can find great mature companies that also pay a dividend that you still believe in their growth story. Uh, Daniel Kern 79 says, I read recently that there isn't a Hebrew word for retirement. Uh, six years of Hebrew school, they never taught us about retirement, so I don't know the answer. <laughs> but I think retirement is a mindset. And uh, I'll take a question from my friend, Chris Morley. Uh, Chris and I went to high school together, junior high as well. Uh, take a question from Chris where he says, laugh out loud, uh, I'm 75% of the way to my retirement target. And while I don't intend to fully retire, I do intend to change into a public service career and thus take a massive pay cut. Yeah, a lot of people do that. I have a, a former boss of mine who did very, very well, who is retired uh, and he stepped back from everything, but he does a lot of nonprofit work. Retirement doesn't have to mean sitting on the beach with an umbrella drink. It could mean doing something different. I know for me, my portfolio, my retirement is so I never have to make a choice because of money. I've been very lucky in the last few years that, hey, we were all able to take a risk and go join a startup company, you know, rather than take the highest paying job we could get because we have a good financial backstop. That's not just about retirement. That's sort of about the whole mindset. Steve, I guess you're the next closest to retirement on the call here. Is it something you've thought of? Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's something I think of. Um, 
yeah, it, it's still a ways off. I just turned 38 the other day and you can see a little bit of the gray showing up on my hair. Max, <laughs> this is what you can look forward to. I, I think you'll have better hair in about eight years when you're where I am. But uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm focusing on just buying the best stocks uh, that I can find and, and holding them. And uh, I think the rest will just, you know, as long as I'm consistently contributing, uh, I think by the time I retire, uh, I won't have to think very hard about it. But um, yeah, uh, it's still 20 years off for me. And and like you you said, Dan, I'm not sure I'll ever retire. This is sort of a, a way I love to keep my mind active. And uh, I think it's maybe the best job in the world to, to have the luxury to research publicly traded stocks all day, every day. Uh, are you going to teach uh, like grizzly bear wrestling or what are you going to do up there? <laughs> <laughs> I already teach grizzly bear wrestling up here. Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you now, I'm not going to work as hard as I do now 20 years from now. But if this show still exists, if what we're doing is still a thing, I'm going to be doing that. I just might be doing it from nicer locations with better pools uh, you know, so, you know, and, and better beach access. That might happen. We're going to the beach as soon as the show is over. So apologies to the rest of the country. We've got a couple more questions in the queue. We've got a few minutes left here, but we're going to take one that came in via email. It's, uh, it's from David. And he says, I'm 42 years old. In the short term, I'm still 100% all stock and high growth at that. At what point do you start selling off some growth and putting it into more stable dividend companies for income? Long-term mindset, but I believe that transaction, transition should happen at some point. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in first here. You don't have to transition into dividends, but you might want to start minimizing your risk as you get closer to retirement. We always talk about don't invest money you don't you need in the next three to five years. If in the next three to five years, you're going to need a portion of your portfolio, it probably shouldn't be in risky stocks. So some of your portfolio as you get older, it's great if it's in dividends, but it should be in companies, uh, you know, I always call them the elephant up a hill companies, like a company like Costco or Microsoft, where you're not likely to wake up and find that they've, you know, they're up 300% based on news, but they're at the end of the year, you're gonna go, oh, well that company went up and it did well. And I think in, in both cases, those companies pay dividends. Um, Steve, any advice you could give for uh, our young 42 year old friend here? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, he's not much older than I am. Uh, actually, this is this is what I did um, at one of the portfolios that I helped manage at uh, my previous employer. It was a, a portfolio designed to uh, cater to people approaching retirement and then who entered the distribution phase. Uh, I don't necessarily uh, see you know, putting it into stable dividend companies for income. That is an approach you can follow. And you can kind of figure out when these companies pay dividends and receive checks throughout the year and uh, kind of live off some of that. But, um, you know, I, I think investing in, again, great companies as you go and uh, relying on a combination of those dividends and just share price appreciation and selling a uh, very small portion of your portfolio every year to help fund uh, your retirement, say 4%. There, there's there's those rules. You can kind of determine what you can live on. But uh, I think you can safely rely on a combination if you have uh, the right stocks and, and maybe a shift to slightly more conservative names, um, like Dan said, is appropriate. Uh, maybe you shouldn't, you know, but uh, I, I do... I think I'll always have uh, at least a small chunk of my portfolio and some high potential, uh, you know, high growth, maybe some riskier names, but it'll be a smaller chunk of my portfolio than it is now. So ZL asks, when is the next subscribers only call? It's the third Friday of the month. That's going to be this Friday at yeah. 11. The invitations actually came to us while we were doing this show. So yeah. it is a busy world here at 7investing. I see a couple more questions in the queue we can take. I've got one more that came to us via Twitter. This one's from Thibodeau. And he says, when it comes to maximizing the service, that would be 7investing, I'm mm -hmm. torn between a concentration approach of picking a few companies that I like best uh, versus buying an equal weight in all of them and maybe even signing up for a company like Folio to make my own ETF. Thoughts? I pick and choose. I actually wrote about this. It's going to go live, if not today, in the next day or two. So if you're a member, you'll be able to see how I use the access to the picks. I always buy my own stock or at least already own it. Uh, and I buy Max and Manisha's stock and I dot them in with others where you guys just blow me away in the presentation. Buying every stock is a lot of stocks. We're working on ways that you might be able to do that. Uh, but Steve, Max, who wants to weigh in here on, on sort of how do you, Max, do you diversify outside your core area by, you know, buying my stable, steady picks in companies everybody's heard of? <laughs> um, no. So I tend to have, I have like a, a smaller portfolio. I think it's getting larger. I buy my, my pick each month uh, so far. So 
Um, but I, I tend to have a more concentrated portfolio. Um, you know, but I have a bottom up investing approach. So I like to, uh, do a lot of analysis, really understand opportunities in, in technology platforms, competitive landscapes. So again, you know, I look at, if I look at a hundred companies, I might only invest in one of them. Um, so I feel relatively confident. Hopefully it's not overconfident in those companies. Uh, so I, I feel fine putting more, more money in that. Um, I do in, in among those companies, I do have more money in some of them than others. Um, so I, again, I, I guess it's personal. I mean, there's no really right or wrong way to do it. Right. Um, but maybe Steve, you, you probably feel better about some companies in your portfolio. You might put more in them, right? You, you don't have an equal weighted portfolio, right? No, not at all. Uh, I don't even when you, when you buy new companies or put more money in your portfolio, you don't equally distribute it, right? No, I don't. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I put more money in companies that I feel strongly about, but, uh, I also don't discount, uh, the possibility that some of those companies that I don't feel as strongly about, um, might outperform significantly unexpectedly. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen, I saw a tweet the other day, someone was talking about, you know, sort of likening the, uh, the NFL, um, you know, draft process, um, to picking stocks that, you know, that you may not expect to outperform. Sometimes you got this like sixth rounder, uh, who ends up being <laughs> the best value ever, you know, and, um, and, Ooh, who, who are we referring to there? Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> Mr. Tom Brady, number 12, who is, uh, I believe, still sleeping off his Super Bowl win. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and that's, you know, I that's why I do put money in some some stocks where I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, like, you know, a lot of the names that you guys bring up that I would have never considered before. That's part of the fun is, uh, you know, m month after month, um, our, our other advisors are 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 bringing up names that I have never heard of, which is saying something for someone who covers literally hundreds of stocks. And uh, it's kind of cool uh, to see that that happen. But, um, you know, there there is something to be said for, you know, some people do buy all of our recommendations and that's been a market beating approach. And I expect it will continue to be uh, as much. But uh, again, it's personal. So. So D wants to know what are some of our books to help retail books we've read that help retail investors uh, become better long-term investors. I will point out that I am in the process, we are in the process, I, I took the lead on this, of writing a book on long-term investing and sort of all the things we talked about today. And everyone on the team is going to be part of that book. Uh, Max is going to do graphics. So we're probably a few months away. I know, you know what I do to be a long-term investor if this wasn't my job where I have to read everything every day? I read other books. I read books about zombies and Star Wars and I like reading about uh, people who have jobs that aren't my job, what their job is like. Um, I tend to read about things that would make me not think about my portfolio. Now, of course, we don't have that luxury because this is what we do for a living. We have to answer questions. But being a long-term investor is making the decision to be a long-term investor and understanding that it's going to work. Uh, Steve, you want to give uh, any particular book a, a pitch here? Yeah, um, you'll see. It. Where is it? Right, right here. Uh, there's the intelligent investor right behind me. Uh, that's not. A, I was turning around earlier because I saw that question come in. Um, some of these old classic books, you know, some of the references are super dated. You know, the first versions of the intelligent investor I think were written back in the '40s, and uh, you know, so. But there are chapters that are, are crucial to. Um, sort of laying the foundations for a proper mindset. Uh, specifically, I think an in intelligent investor chapters eight and chapter 19, uh, margin of safety uh, for the latter as a central concept of investing. And uh, the former is, um, oh, geez, I forget the topics, but uh, yeah, fantastic book there just to read, uh, keeping in mind that it's kind of a dated reference. Another one that I really love that you'll see kind of right next to Americana up here is uh, is Hundred Baggers by Chris Mayer. And uh, that's a fantastic book. I did an interview with Chris um, just several months ago and uh, to talk about finding stocks that return 100 times in value. And that is really a testament to the power of long term investing, because I think the shortest amount of time that a stock took to return 100 times uh, its its initial investment was like I don't know, four and a half years or something. And the longest one was 40 something years. Um, so again, thinking in years uh, really helps that way. Um, but uh, yeah, so 100 Baggers by Chris Mayer is great. Uh, Intelligent Investor is great. Uh, but also read books that may not, you know, I, I read a book called uh, about Jim Simons 
the uh, the quantitative investor, um, you know, I think he he has he runs a big quantitative firm, um, quants, and it's called the Man Who Solved the Market, and uh, that's another good book to kind of help you understand the other side and what you're up against. I mean, you're talking about just a bunch of uh, PhDs in computer science who <laughs> don't admittedly don't know a thing about the businesses they're buying. And, uh, you know, they're doing little micro trades that happen millions of times a day. And, uh, you know, that's that's what day traders are kind of up against when they're looking at trends and stuff like this. And that's a really hard way to make money. And, um, you know, so that was a good book, too. But so, Max, you're a millennial. Are there any uh, graphic novels or comic books we should be reading to, uh, <laughs> to be up to speed on investing? Sorry, that was a dig. That was... Wow. Wow. Well, I'm a voracious reader myself. I won't point to my books because uh, I'm humble, unlike Steve. <laughs> so um, one book that's really good if you're a beginner, uh, it's, it's Earnings That Count. Uh, uh, it walks through all of how to read income statements, balance sheets, cash flow statements. Um, and again, I think they talk about like Wrigley is one of the examples they use. So that's a very <laughs> outdated example. <laughs> but uh, but it's a good book and it's it's a quick read. It's easy to digest. It really uh, is a good way to get your feet wet and, and really understand what all the numbers mean. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, more experienced, a little more, uh, you know, nerdy, uh, against the odds, I'm sorry, against the gods is the book and it's the history of risk. So it goes through the centuries, how we've quantified risk. Um, I mean, literally centuries and then up through the stock market and it helps to kind of color, you know, long-term investing, why you should be a long-term investor, um, how to think about risk. It, it, it's a good book to, uh, to get the wheels turning. We have about three minutes left. Sam Bailey, we're going to skip the finisher to get to the last questions here. I will use that on Wednesday's show. So I'll give one pit pitch to an old friend of ours, Morgan Housel's Psychology of Money. Uh, it isn't so much about investing as it is about how we view money and why it matters. Uh, amazingly, they're making a book. Uh, they're making a movie out of that book. I'm not sure what that's going to look like, uh, but that is a really, really good one. That is also behind Steve. <laughs> Max, if you want to take uh, Ralph Mardini's question as the final question of the night, I'll let you read that one out loud. Yeah, so he has two here. We'll go with the first one. Uh, when it comes to biotech, small cap, how can a company share the story in the right way to attract investors? Um, so, you know, that's maybe a little beyond the scope of seven investing, but you know, there's been a lot that's been written and, and discussed about science communication. You know, there is some amount of storytelling that all companies have to do, especially in, you know, drug development or biotech or industrial biotech, because uh, these are crazy concepts and a lot of technical terms and jargon. So you do need to communicate it with, you know, the, the layman out there uh, to, to pitch your company and your business and make it, you know, digestible. Um, you know, but I guess there's just that balance of hyping yourself up and actually just keeping your head down and building a better product and platform, right? Um, you know, Elon Musk, say what you will about him. I don't necessarily think, he, I'm not too fond of him, but he has some good comments about, hey, look, you know, like we don't really market ourselves that much or we didn't for a very long time at Tesla. And, you know, we just focused on making a better product. More entrepreneurs should do that rather than going on to conferences and trying to be the keynote speaker, trying to get their face on a magazine. A lot of those companies or startups aren't actually good companies or businesses. Um, so definitely be cautious about that. You need to uh, you know, execute above all else. The challenge is companies need to fund operations. So there needs to be a balance of that. But that's why we have Max and, and Manisha in that space. They can dig into these companies and go, okay, is this a guy who's really, really good at press conferences? Look, I'd be an excellent CEO when it comes to like the public story of the company. You know what I'm not great at? Biotech. So like if, if there's a guy like me and a guy like me could be the CEO of a company who isn't necessarily the scientist or the inventor, but you have to dig in and go, okay, this company says it's revolutionizing whatever. Is it on a path to do that? Is, is what it's saying possible? And that takes you back to thesis. And look, we're going to be wrong. There are companies I really, really believed in. I, I, I bring this one up all the time. I believed that J.C. Penney under Marvin Ellison was going to be a turnaround story like Best Buy. He did everything right and everything still went wrong. Like So j just being a good leader doesn't always mean you're going to win. Just having the right idea. You know, Max could pick a company that's going to revolutionize some area of, of medicine and some other company two years later could dumb luck stumble upon a, a better mousetrap that does the same thing. And it doesn't matter how brilliant the first company, or it could be a worse mousetrap that's cheaper and easier to make or has a better name or a snappier commercial. <laughs> Long-term investing is easy. 
waiting is hard. That you know, we we use the term a lot, get rich slowly. This isn't going to happen overnight. It's kind of fun now where everything's a little frothy and stocks go up 20% and down and it's just all crazy. That's <laughs> not what normally happens. So this was a very special edition of 7 Investing Now. I, I feel like this one they're going to show in classrooms. We're going to be you know bringing this up for a long term. We appreciate so many of you participating. Uh, we will think about a book list uh, on our website or on Amazon or somewhere, Chris Morley. Uh, that would be a good idea. We have so many good ideas. We actually have a Slack channel called Good Ideas. Uh, with that, I am Dan Klein. For Steve Simonton, for Max Chatsko, for Sam Bailey behind the scenes, thank you. We will see you Wednesday.